Uh, well, uh, hello guys, hello everyone. Uh, I'm glad to see you, <laughs> but I don't see you. Anyway, I hope you see me and I hope you see uh, the screen now. And today we will talk about modern global anthropogenic changes in climate and environment. Yeah. So, uh, what we will talk about uh, in this uh, lecture? There are a few questions uh, to, to answer. First, what actually present day global climate changes mean? Uh, what exactly this term means? How does man influence climate? How was it before, uh, many time ago, when uh, man did not exist? Yeah, and how uh, how do we know this? Actually, uh, what will be uh, the Earth's climate in future, at least in the uh, 21st century? Uh, what are the links between climate changes and environmental pollution, if uh, any? Well, okay. Uh, one thing we can uh, tell about climate uh, for sure: yeah, it's changing all the time. So we know uh, perfectly that uh, a few hundred years ago, for example, in uh, Europe, uh, the climate was much colder than now. Yeah, it was uh, the so uh, the epoch of so-called uh, Little Ice Age. It was uh, much colder than, than uh, the present day. One thousand years, it was uh, a bit warmer than now. For example, yeah? uh, so what's wrong actually with uh, the present day uh, global uh, warming? Uh, why we are discussing it uh, all the time, maybe it's just uh, natural. First of all, what does modern global warming uh, mean? Uh, you know, there are instrumental uh, observations of temperature everywhere on Earth. We have meteorological stations measuring uh, temperature, humidity, pressure, etc. Yeah? And then if we combine the data over the past 150 years, uh, on the air temperature, we observe something like this, yeah? So the temperature is uh, growing, at least since the uh, uh, beginning of the uh, 20th century or, or so. Uh, and if you look uh, uh, to decadal average uh, data, you see, for example, that the last uh, five decades, uh, each uh, decade was uh, warmer than, than the previous one. So the modern global warming is uh, simply a statement uh, of fact. It's just uh, instrumentally observed increase of uh, air temperature on our planet. Well, but what is the reason uh, for this uh, warming? And uh, what happened uh, before in the pre previous uh, times when we did not have uh, instrumental observations, we, which uh, started only like something like in uh, the middle of uh, uh, 19th century. So to understand what is going on now, we need to know what happened in, uh, in, in the past. And for this, uh, we uh, use the, uh, the, the scientific field, which is called paleogeography. Paleogeography. So it's uh, the science about past uh, climates, past uh, environmental situations on our planet. How can we know what the climate was uh, before? There are many, many methods about this. Maybe the most uh, well-known method is uh, uh, this uh, dendrochronology. Yeah? Uh, yeah, dendrochronology. So we cut the trees or drill the small cores in these trees. Yeah? And uh, we study each uh, layer uh, any layer of this uh, tree. We study some uh, uh, chemicals in this tree and so we can uh, understand what was the conditions, meteorological conditions during uh, this, uh, the growing of this uh, plant. Yeah? What was temperature, humidity, etc. We may use the deposits, uh, sediments in, uh, uh, in some uh, water volumes like uh, lakes or oceans. We can also study some geochemical content in, in this uh, sediment. Uh, we may study some uh, calcite uh, depositions like uh, stalagmites or corals or something like this. And finally, for example, we may study the snow deposits uh, on, uh, on the glaciers. Uh, 
Well, generally speaking, uh, if we have an object where the material is accumulating uh, constantly year by year, so this object could be suitable for paleogeographical uh, studies. Uh, there are also other methods, not methods, not only geo geochemical or geophysical ones. For example, geomorphology. Yeah, when you look to this uh, beautiful picture taken somewhere in Antarctica, you see that uh, these uh, traces of uh, flowing water. So before many many million years ago, water was flowing here. It means that the climate was much warmer than now. And the same picture is observed on uh, Mars, for example. Now. Uh, if uh, we combine uh, if we combine uh, these this paleogeographical data for the past 2000 years for example uh, we see the picture like this uh, shown on this slide so the climate was more or less uh, uh, stable constant yeah uh, here we have this uh, cooling of this ice age and now in 20th, in 20th century, we see this very fast uh, growing of temperature. If we look at this picture now, we understand that, well, probably something is really going wrong with the present day uh, climate on our planet. Yeah? We live actually in uh, the warmest epoch since 2000 years ago. And if you go even uh, further back in time, we will realize that we uh, live in the warmest epoch since probably 100 thousand years or so well uh, and now uh, why the modern warming is uh, unique well first it is very fast you know this uh, growing of temperature uh, by one degree in 100 years it's actually unprecedented we never have seen this before in the past uh, times and if we take uh, you know the uh, last 50 years rate of uh, temperature increases even even the rate is like one and a half degrees in a, in a century well then it's global if you take a look uh, to this little ice age uh, situation uh, we see that in some uh, regions there was uh, cooling in some regions there was warming on average it was a slight warming this epoch but you know, you see that uh, the climate uh, was different in different regions but if you look now uh, what's happening on our planet you see this red color is uh, is, uh, is is actually warming this uh, how to say uh, pink or magenta color is actually where warming is might is even greater and only one small uh, spot uh, here which is blue it means there is a slight cooling here. so we will talk about this later so everywhere on our planet, we observe this, uh, this uh, woman. And finally, it is thought or believed to be uh, anthropogenic in, uh, in origin. And let's talk about the, the last uh, sentence, yeah? Uh, when we say about anthropogenic influence on our climate, we first of all uh, remember the greenhouse. So now we have to, to discuss what greenhouse effect means. Well, the idea that the atmosphere somehow warms our planet, uh, this idea, it, it comes from uh, many centuries years ago, at least uh, in, uh, in the 18th century already, it was well understood. But the guy who first described this uh, process physically, comprehensively, it was uh, Svante Arrhenius, uh, a Sweden uh, scientist. So in 1896, he wrote the paper, on the influence, influence of carbon acid in the air uh, upon the temperature of the ground. Yeah, and it's not a really correct term. Uh, I can explain why if you want later. Okay, so the principle of the greenhouse uh, effect is, uh, is quite simple actually, yeah? So if uh, we have a planet without atmosphere, so what happens? The planet receives a shortwave radiation uh, from the from the star sun for example, yeah and it it warms yeah and as soon as it warms it starts to release the long wave radiation back to space and the warmest planet the more this uh, long wave uh, radiation right so at certain uh, at certain temperature there will be thermal equilibrium so the planet receive the same amount of energy and release the same amount of energy and now we add uh, atmosphere. 
with greenhouse gases. Uh, what happens uh, in this situation? So the planet receives this shortwave radiation because uh, atmosphere is transparent for shortwave radiation. Yeah, you can, it's, it's, it's quite obvious. Otherwise, we could not uh, enjoy uh, the stars in the night. And it starts to release the uh, infrared uh, uh, long wave radiation. Yeah, but uh, for this radiation, for this infrared light, the atmosphere is not actually transparent. And the atmosphere it captures part of this radiation and starts to starts to uh, warm itself, and then it starts to radiate back uh, to the uh, surface of the planet. And only small part of this uh, long wave radiation go back to space. And in this system, you need uh, to warm the surface of the planet uh, uh, much more, you know, to, to reach this uh, thermal equilibrium. So the principles are really, uh, really very simple. Well, uh, of course, the situation is a bit more complicated, yeah, in reality, uh, as always. So we also have uh, clouds which reflect uh, part of the uh, incoming solar radiation. Also, the Earth's uh, surface uh, reflects in part of the uh, radiation. We have also uh, processes like uh, uh, con convection, which uh, also trans tra transform uh, heat from uh, surface to atmosphere. We have also phase transitions, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the influence of, uh, of uh, uh, greenhouse effect is, is obvious in, uh, on our planet. I always like, you know, to ask this uh, quite stupid question, yeah? Is greenhouse effect good or bad for us? Well, in nature, you know, there is nothing good or bad. In, na in nature, everything is kind of normal, yeah? But uh, for us, uh, for us, greenhouse effect is really very good, yeah? Because without it, our planet, the temperature of our planet would be like uh, minus 25 degrees C. So the greenhouse effect warms our planet by about 40 degrees, just making the life uh, possible here, you know. What are the main greenhouse gases? Well, the major one is actually water vapor. Yeah, because uh, the concentration of this gas is uh, very uh, substantial in, uh, in our atmosphere. Uh, and why, then why we are not talking always about the uh, greenhouse effect by water wave? Yes, we do, but you know that um, mm, the concentration of, of this uh, water vapor in atmosphere, it has certain physical limits because water vapor easily condensates, yeah? Unlike uh, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is the next one. Uh, uh, the, the amount of this gas is uh, quite small, but the effect is uh, huge. And the uh, uh, amount of this gas is actually unlimited. You may increase it as much as you want. The next gas is uh, methane. It's much more powerful than carbon dioxide. But the amount of this gas is much, much less, fortunately for us. Yeah? And then the next gas is ozone. And there are many, many uh, other, ga other ga gases with uh, greenhouse effect. And, you know, the uh, role of greenhouse effects in uh, the climate of our planet, it's actually well known since uh, uh, many decades ago. If you take any textbook uh, on climate, like from 50 years ago, you, you will read about it. There are many examples uh, about the uh, influence of, uh, of this effect. For example, this uh, uh, carbon uh, glycological era, like 350 million years ago, yeah? It, there were much more uh, CO2 in atmosphere and the climate was mu much, much warmer than now. And then the plants uh, became uh, developing very fast. And uh, after they died, they could not uh, be, how to say, degraded or rotten uh, completely by bacteria. So this organic started to accumulate uh, somewhere on the earth, on the ground. And by this process, uh, the plant removed substantial amount of CO2 of carbon from atmosphere, yeah? And then the climate started to cool, to cool down, which ended fin finally in a huge glaciation and in a mass extinction. Just, just one example, yeah? The uh, uh, human influence on uh, climate is, is not a new idea as well, you know? 
already in 1960s, 1970s, uh, uh, the scientists uh, wrote about this. One really brilliant example is uh, our Russian uh, uh, scientist, Mikha uh, Mikhail Budika. He lived here in this city, in St. Petersburg. So in 1970, uh, he published papers about the, the future climate. And he wrote just a citation from his, uh, from his works. Due to human economical activity, the CO2 concentration will grow up to 0.038% uh, by the end of the century. Models show that by the end of the century, the temperature will rise by half degree C due to increased CO2. Well, when he wrote these uh, papers, the situation uh, looked like this, you know, there was not a sign of uh, warming yet, yeah? It was uh, even a slight cooling that time. So for many people, these uh, ideas uh, could seem, you know, strange somehow. But after he published his, uh, his uh, works, the situation went uh, uh, like this. This very uh, rapid uh, warming uh, began. And surprisingly, uh, you know, that uh, his uh, forecast actually was very, very correct despite the fact that he used very simple uh, models, uh, very sim simple, sim simple uh, computers or something like this. So the actual numbers in the end of the century was like this. So yeah, you see that he was uh, very, very precise in, in his predictions. And at the, same, <coughs> at the same time, in 1970s, a new era of paleoclimatic investigations began because people started to drill ice in Antarctica and in Greenland and to study ice cores, which is shown uh, on this uh, picture. This is ice core, this is a drill system, etc. Yeah. So this is Antarctica, Antarctic continent, the most cold one on our planet. And here I showed the main, uh, the main points when, where people uh, drilled ice and studied ice cores. So the German station of uh, Konan here, Japanese station Dom Fuji, uh, Chinese station Dome A, European station Dome C, Concordia. This is American project Hueys, and finally Russian project of uh, Vostok. The, here drilling started in 1970s. It was one of the first deep ice drilling. Okay. And why actually the uh, Antarctic ice is uh, so important for us? Uh, because uh, it's really a cornucopia of uh, climate information. We may measure the isotopic uh, content of this ice and which uh, it gives us the actually estimation of uh, air temperature in the past. We can measure the content of uh, inclusions, mineral inclusions like dust or soluble inclusions, sea salts, uh, cosmogenic isotopes, uh, some uh, pollutions uh, and uh, human pollutions as well, some volcanic products, yeah? And maybe the most important, or very important that uh, the ice contains these air bubbles, so we may directly measure the uh, concentration of gases in atmosphere in the past, including the greenhouse gases. Well, so let's have a look what we know from uh, from the ice cores about the climate of our planet for the past uh, uh, half a million year. Okay, let's start from the top. Yeah, for example. So here we have a dust concentration. Now let's better start from temperature. Actually. Yeah, this uh, red line is a, uh, is a temperature. So we live here in a, a warm period uh, called uh, Holocene, yeah? The present day interglacial. So the 30,000 years ago, uh, there was a previous cold period, previous cold era or ice age, yeah? with a temperature like 10 degrees uh, colder than now yeah, in, in Antarctica. 120 years ago, it was a previous interg inter interglacial, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we see these cycles and each cycle is something like 100,000 years. Short warm periods and long uh, cold periods. And now go back to, to atmospheric uh, dust. So in cold periods, the concentration of dust was uh, like 20 or 30 times more than now, which means that uh, the climate was more arid, so more dry uh, in the cold, uh, cold eras, and the atmospheric circula circulation was uh, more intensive, 
and also the area of of uh, uh, of continents was uh, more than now yeah because the sea level was like 120 meters lower than now so the surface of uh, oceans was less than now and why the sea level was uh, lower than now because a lot of uh, ice a lot of uh, sorry a lot of water uh, was stored on the continent as a uh, ice as ice sheet yeah and finally by green uh, the concentration of uh, greenhouse gases is, is, uh, is, is shown. This is a CO2 and this is a methane. And for the first time, when we studied the ice cores, we saw that actually temperature and CO2 is really very well correlated with each other, you know? So it was uh, understood theoretically but by that time, but uh, there were not very many uh, uh, experimental uh, evidence of this. So the, it was uh, from the ice cores that for the first time we saw this beautiful correlation between temperature and the greenhouse gases in our planet. Uh, but uh, does it mean that uh, greenhouse gas, gases were the initial push, push of these uh, uh, climate variations? Well, actually not. The initial push came from the uh, solar insulation. And then this very uh, small, actually, very... Uh, weak initial push was uh, enhanced somehow by the uh, feedbacks uh, in uh, the climate system, in oceans, in uh, ice sheets. And uh, the, the, the main driver of this temperature rise, it was a, a greenhouse gas. And uh, another uh, thing that we learned from the ice cores is that present day concentration of greenhouse gases is absolutely abnormal. Yeah. If we see the concentration of CO2, for example, uh, during the past uh, half a million year, so the concentration changed between uh, about 180 and 280 ppm or parts per million. For example, 200 parts per million uh, ppm, it equal to 0.02% uh, uh, for, you, for your understanding, okay? And now we have uh, this uh, amount of CO2, more than 400 or, and 10 ppm. And for methane, this is situation, it's even uh, worse, yeah? So before it changed between four and 700 ppb, parts per billion, and now it's like two or three times more. So looking at this picture, we understand that the present day concentration of uh, greenhouse gases in, uh, in atmosphere is absolutely not known. Uh, it never happened before for, ma for many, many million years. Well, okay. Oh, yeah, it's another picture about this, uh, 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 about this uh, data from uh, ice cores. So by points, uh, the concentration of CO2 from ice cores, uh, ice cores uh, is shown, and the line is an uh, instrumental observation uh, in uh, present day on the observatories. And you see that there is a period of overlap, and you see that the, the both set of data actually uh, correspond uh, very, very well. We also may ask a question, when did we last have this concentration of, uh, of CO2 uh, like now? Well, uh, we do not really know uh, for sure, but probably it was 3 million years ago, but maybe 15 million years ago or so. So the concentration of CO2 changed like this in the past, yeah? And now we, have, we are at this level, something like this. Okay, well, now we, we understand we, uh, uh, it's a scientific, uh, scientific uh, fact that uh, the present day concentration of CO2 is not, is not normal. Yeah? But probably it's uh, natural by origin. How can we prove that it is a, is a human? Actually? To answer this question, we first need to look at the carbon cycle of our planet. And let's start from, uh, from atmosphere. So uh, before, before human uh, uh, activity came on the scene, the amount of uh, carbon in the in atmosphere was something like 
uh, 600 uh, billion ton or gigaton, yeah? And uh, what happened with this uh, carbon? Well, first it, consume, it is uh, consume, consumed by plants, yeah? By trees, by, uh, by grass, etc. And uh, each year the plants consume something like 120 billion ton of, of, of carbon, yeah? So all the trees on, on Earth can eat the atmospheric carbon in only five or six years, but it, it doesn't happen. Why? Well, it doesn't happen because plants and trees also release the carbon back to atmosphere during uh, breathing and during uh, uh, decay after, after they die. Then the CO2 is uh, dissolved easily in, uh, in, uh, in water. So it goes to, uh, it goes to ocean. And uh, it exists there in the form of dissolved uh, uh, organic and inorganic uh, carbon, which is then consumed by uh, uh, marine uh, microbiota and uh, by uh, marine uh, species, etc., etc. Yeah? But the ocean also releases uh, carbon back to, to atmosphere, and all this uh, all these uh, fluxes of carbon was equilibrated. Uh, in the past. Also, we have a lot of carbon stored in uh, fossil fuel, just some huge amount, few thousand uh, billion ton of, of, of carbon, and in permafrost. Actually, nobody knows how many carbon is stored there, but it's also a huge amount. And look at this, for example, volcanoes. Uh, yeah, volcanoes release a uh, not big amount of, of CO2, actually, something like 0.1 uh, uh, billion ton uh, every year. And then uh, the humans came, yeah? And uh, what we started to do? We started to dig out uh, coal uh, and oil and gas, and we used this uh, fossil, uh, fossil organic uh, as, a, as a fuel, yeah? To get energy and heat. And uh, actually, each year we release, uh, by this process, each year we release something like maybe eight or nine uh, billion of, of ton of uh, CO2 of carbon to, to atmosphere. And uh, it's actually, this, this is a huge amount, actually, you know. So we release to atmosphere like 100 times more uh, CO2 than all the uh, volcanoes on our planet. Can you imagine this? Yeah. Well, and uh, since uh, last uh, 150 years, we took uh, like uh, more than uh, ne nearly 400 uh, billion ton of, of, of carbon and released it to atmosphere. And this extra carbon started to circulate uh, in these uh, natural uh, loops. So extra carbon is now assumed by plants. Extra carbon is now dissolved in the ocean. But nature cannot uh, digest all the carbon we uh, introduce to the system because we introduce just too much. Yeah, so some carbon is accumulating in uh, atmosphere, and during uh, the present 150 years, so this amount of carbon uh, accumulated in the atmosphere. Well, actually, it's uh, it, this graph is a little bit old because things are changing very fast. So now this uh, this uh, amount is uh, is like this. So 275 billion ton of carbon has accumulated in atmosphere uh, due to human activity. Actually, there are many proofs uh, that the, this extra CO2 is uh, of human origin. I really li li like this, uh, this one, for example, yeah? So uh, uh, when we burn the fuel, we need, uh, for this reaction, we need the oxygen, yeah? So, to, to, to combust uh, the, the gas or oil, we need uh, oxygen. And the oxygen is taken from atmosphere. It means if carbon dioxide increases, the oxygen in atmosphere must decrease at the same time. And this is actually what, the, what is happening now, yeah? As soon as CO2 is increasing, the oxygen content in atmosphere is decreasing. And next proof uh, go, uh, comes from geochemistry. Uh, for some reason, uh, the concentration of heavy uh, isotopes of carbon in uh, uh, organic uh, uh, fuel, in uh, fossil fuel, is, uh, is uh, reduced. 
So when we take this uh, uh, carbon, uh, isotopically light carbon, and release it to atmosphere, the isotopic uh, content of atmospheric uh, CO2 must uh, decrease actually. Yeah? And this is uh, what is uh, happening now, what is observed uh, now. It would not be the same if this uh, CO2 come from uh, volcanoes, for example. Uh, how else does man influence uh, climate? Uh, is it only a uh, uh, greenhouse effect? No, no, of course not. So we influence climate in many, many ways. Yeah? Uh, the, well, the greenhouse effect is the most obvious one. And uh, let's not forget that we have many greenhouse gases here. Yeah? But uh, not all the processes lead to warming of our planet. There are many processes which lead to cooling effect. For example, the release of aerosols. Yeah, we produce a lot of dust of aerosols. And their aerosols behave in, uh, in different ways. Some of them can uh, warm the planet because they uh, act like uh, also green, they also have a greenhouse effect. But some aerosols uh, may reflect uh, solar light, for example. Yeah and then it leads to cooling of, of the planet. Also, <clears throat> we have uh, more clouds now than before, also due to increased aerosol uh, concentration. And cl clouds also reflect the sunlight, just slightly cooling of our planet. Also, albedo of us cha changing, albedo it's, uh, uh, how to say, uh, al uh, albedo is a reflective, uh, 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 property of our planet. Uh, the more is albedo coefficient, the more uh, energy the surface uh, reflects, okay? So albedo is changing and the su surface of Earth reflecting more energy than, than before. So there are many processes, but the sum of this process leads to uh, overall warming, okay? And now look at the natural factors, which are sitting here. They're just tiny compared to the uh, to the anthropogenic factors. And this is the next uh, slide, the next question we, we uh, want to answer. What is the relationship between natural and anthropogenic factors in the, in the climate now? Yeah? So this is the total uh, temperature anomaly on our planet for the past 120 years or so. And now we break this uh, apart into different uh, influences, different uh, uh, factors and forces. Uh, okay, the first one is uh, solar activity. Yeah, solar activity uh, is, is well; it's it is shown here. And actually, the last decades, the uh, we receive a little bit less uh, solar energy than before. So no, this factor cannot explain the warming. No way. Then uh, volcanic uh, component. Yeah, after each big volcano eruption, uh, uh, so we have more aerosols in atmosphere and they start to re reflect the, the sunlight. And then uh, the planet is, uh, is cooling for one, two or three years or so. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in the last decades, the volcanic activity also a little bit increased. So it's also led to slight cooling of our uh, planet. So no, this factor cannot explain the uh, global warming as well. We have also some internal variability like uh, El Nino events, etc., which cannot also explain the, the warming. And uh, anthropogenic component is account for more than or about 90% of, of climate variability in 20th century. Yeah. And the likelihood of this statement is nearly 100%. Uh, it's a five sigma, if you understand the statistics. Yeah? So it's more than 99.9% .9 of likelihood that it is anthropogenic influence that the present uh, uh, anthropogenic influence on the uh, present day global warming. We may look uh, at this picture in a slightly other way, yeah? So, the black line here is the observed temperature changes. And these color, colored lines, it's a uh, model runs that try to explain the, uh, this uh, temperature variability. And this graph is without uh, anthropogenic influence, only natural factors. 
you see that in no way we can explain this uh, warming only by natural factors. Only when you add uh, the anthropogenic influence, you may explain this uh, uh, warming trend. Well, okay, uh, people uh, quite often ask, is it possible that the cooling will, uh, uh, will come? Yeah, the warming will turn into cooling in the next uh, years or decades. Well, for me, this uh, question uh, sounds a little bit strange and the simple answer is no, no way, absolutely not. Okay, but still let's, uh, let's us consider uh, some uh, scenar scenarios. Uh, one of these scenarios is shown in this uh, beautiful uh, movie, uh, The Day After Tomorrow, I hope you remember it. This uh, movie is uh, somehow, well, I would say strange, a lot of scientific nonsense is shown there, but Maybe it's, uh, it uh, will sound strange for you, but the main idea of this movie is actually quite reasonable. You know? uh, so they, in this movie, they said that uh, because of, uh, of warming, Greenland started to melt. Uh, this melt water came to North Atlantica, uh, just stopping Gulf Stream current, and that this led to cooling in the uh, Northern Hemisphere. Well, strange enough, but this actually uh, happened in our uh, planet before. The last time such event uh, happened uh, 8,000 uh, years ago or so, yeah? And uh, some people believe that probably it may happen uh, now again because of uh, melt water which is coming to North Atlantic from Greenland. And actually, if you look at this, uh, at this region, you see that really uh, we have some cooling here. Yeah, in this way. and uh, the Gulf Stream uh, current is uh, became a little bit weaker because of uh, global warming. But according to the uh, models, to the calculation of oceanologists, well, such a, a great cooling event as happened 8,000 year, years ago, it cannot uh, happen now. It's not enough melt water coming to this system. Uh, next uh, question you may uh, ask me. Okay, what about the next uh, ice age, yeah? So we live now in an uh, interglacial period and uh, the new glacial uh, period should come in a, in, a, in a certain time. Probably yes. So let's, uh, let's use uh, the paleogeography, uh, paleogeography data to answer the question when the next ice age will come. So, we compare the present day uh, temperature curve in our warm period in Holocene with a similar warm period 400,000 years ago. It's a marine isotopic stage 11. Yeah. So if we use this, if we use uh, this uh, MIS 11 uh, situation as, as an analog for Holocene, then the next uh, 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 ice age may come in about 10,000 uh, years from now, which is not actual for us, yeah, because we live now, we are, we are interested to know what will happen in the next decades, not in the next uh, 10,000 years, so it's not actually relevant to our situation. And also, uh, 400,000 years ago, the CO2 concentration was at this level, yeah, but now we have this level. Yeah, so, and as a climatologist say, so the climate models say that uh, with a CO2 concentration in atmosphere, more, more than 400 uh, ppm, the next ice age will simply not come ever. Yeah, simply because uh, uh, the greenhouse effect uh, became uh, stronger than the influence of natural factors like influence of, of, uh, of sun. Well, okay, what else uh, happen, happens in, uh, with our planet now? It's not only warming, of course. So this is, uh, this is why we prefer to, to say not about climate warming, but about climate uh, changes or uh, environmental changes. Well, aside, aside from warming itself, the probability of extreme events uh, became, become uh, higher now, yeah? 
it means uh, that uh, heat waves in summer may become more often, but uh, all, uh, also uh, extreme cooling in winter may become more often. You know, it's not a, it's not in contradiction with uh, general warming. Also, of course, the uh, melt uh, of uh, uh, glaciers and uh, sea ice is absorbed now. Well, that's quite simple, yeah. As soon as you warm the ice, it, it starts to melt. Then permafrost is uh, going everywhere in, in the Arctic, and it's a quite dangerous, actually, situation because, well, first of all, it's a danger for infrastructure, but also the uh, melt of permafrost may release uh, the big amount of methane, which is uh, stored in there. Then uh, mass extinction. So the bio biological species, uh, the mammals, they are they are dying actually, not directly because of, uh, uh, not always directly because of climate uh, changes. We simply kill them, we take their territory because we need to grow our plants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They also die because of diseases uh, 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 and other factors. Yeah. Also, the vegetation zones are shifting uh, uh, northward, yeah, because the climate beca uh, became warmer. Then it means that uh, the uh, new plants start to 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 grow uh, in this place. For example, where we had a tundra, now we have a taiga already, some, somewhere in the in the Arctic, and tundra also uh, moves northward. Then uh, some uh, the diseases will become uh, more frequent uh, in the future and already became uh, more frequent now something like some uh, for example malaria or uh, anthrax or, or stuff like this uh, next pro uh, a lot of processes is happening in the in the ocean because uh, ocean uh, uh, is dissolving uh, more CO2 than before. It's become more acid, which could be dangerous for marine species like uh, corals, for example, or fishes. And also we observe uh, hypoxia in the ocean. So less amount of uh, dissolved oxygen, which is also not, not, not good for, for marine species, etc., etc. There are many, many uh, quite complicated processes going on. Okay, what will happen next? There will be further warming, yes, that's for sure. There is no uh, queen scenario, scenarios for us. And uh, it's, uh, the explanation of this is, uh, is very uh, simple. Well, first of all, the CO2 gas is uh, quite, uh, how to say, stable. Uh, there is a bigger inertia in, in this system. So as soon as we release a lot of CO2 to atmosphere, it will stay there for decades and for centuries. Yeah, it cannot go away very fast. And also the uh, temperature of atmosphere of our planet is not in equilibrium with uh, CO2. So even we, if we fix the amount of CO2 like, uh, uh, like uh, now, the temperature will be growing and growing as a, a reaction on this CO2 level. So there is just no physical uh, uh, reason for the cooling in the, in the next decades at least uh, until the end of this century. But the real, uh, uh, how to say, development of the situation will depend on actually on human activity. There are uh, different scenarios shown here by blue and by red. And these scenarios, it only depend on the human economical uh, activity. The blue scenario, uh, it, uh, it is related with the reduced uh, emission of CO2 in the future. Yeah? If we really start to do, to do something with it. If we do not start to do something uh, with this, if we leave as we did before, business as usual, then the situation will uh, go like this and the temperature will uh, go up to four degree more than now. And actually, the this difference between these uh, scenarios, it's not only uh, quantitative, it's a quality. Yeah? If we go uh, in this blue scenario, the planet Earth will stay more or less like it looks now. But if we go to red scenario, 
So many, many changes, uh, irreversible changes will happen. Why is it so? Because our uh, planet, our climate system uh, behaves not in a non-linear uh, mode. Yeah. What is not? What is a non-linear system? Okay. Let's consider this. Uh, for example, yeah, crystal ball sitting on the top of the hill. Yeah, with a small plateau on the top. If you push slightly this ball this way or this way, well, the ball will react. Uh, yeah, it will move. But if uh, you go here, just very little push will uh, uh, let this ball, uh, how to say, move uh, uh, really fast, you know, until it reach the next uh, stable uh, position. So this is called the nonlinear system. And our planet behaves exactly like this, you know. You may increase uh, temperature little by little, little by little, and then suddenly with only a very small increase of temperature, the system just will exploit and go to <laughs> the wrong direction. There are very many examples of this. Uh, I can show you, I may show you only one. Yeah? And this one example is a sea level. Yeah? So we have uh, these different scenarios here. Uh, so if it's uh, able to keep the temperature uh, in the like 1.5 degree C or 2 degree C uh, compared to pre-industrial, then the uh, sea level will rise probably only, only slightly by uh, the end of uh, 21st century, like maybe uh, 40 centimeters or so. But if the temperature uh, increase will exceed uh, like two degrees, then the irreversible degradation, disintegration of parts of Antarctic ice sheet uh, will start because Antarctic ice sheet is somehow dynamically not stable, you know. So if temperature will uh, pass certain thresholds, then uh, these uh, glaciers, these ice sheets uh, become to disintegrate and then the sea level will go to very, very uh, high values, like uh, 15 meters in, uh, in 500 years. And this process will be really, uh, you know, irreversible. It means that even if we uh, uh, return temperature to the same level as uh, 100 years uh, before, uh, well, the ice sheet will uh, continue to, to disintegrate. Yeah, this is just a comparison how Antarctica look now and how it may look in, uh, in uh, 500 years. Thus, uh, I lead you to the idea that the, uh, actually the further warming is unbearable for our planet. Uh, and this uh, th uh, dangerous threat threshold, it uh, lies somewhere between 1.5 degrees C and, uh, and uh, 2 degrees C. Oh, sorry, it's a small pattern in Russian here, but I will translate for you. Uh, and so if you want to keep the temperature in the limit of 1.5 degrees C, uh, we need uh, to take the massive and uh, very urgent uh, actions. We need to uh, decrease the uh, CO2 uh, emission by about by half in uh, uh, by 2030. And uh, by 2050, about 85% of energy must be taken from, uh, uh, from other sources, from natural sources. When, uh, yeah, when will we reach uh, this 1.5 uh, level of uh, warming? Well, first I need to say that uh, these uh, figures, 1.5 level of warming, 2 uh, degree C warming, it's not uh, compared to present day, it's compared to pre-industrial period. And since pre-industrial period, we have already warmed our planet uh, by one degree C, okay? So to reach 1.5 degree C, we only need a uh, half of the degree. And with the current rate of warming, we may reach this uh, level of 1.5 degrees in uh, by uh, 2030 is the earliest. 
well, probably it will be uh, 2040 or later. Yeah, we don't know. But uh, the time is really, uh, the time is up. Yep. Okay, how to reduce the CO2 emissions and what we can do about this? Uh, we, I mean, uh, simple people, yeah? Not, not, uh, no, not uh, governments. Well, if you see, if you look to the uh, structure of uh, greenhouse gas emissions by different economic sectors, then uh, you can uh, find the answer yourself. Yeah, of course, the, a lot of emissions comes from transport and industry and, and construction of buildings. But maybe surprisingly for you, a lot of uh, CO2 comes from uh, land use, from ag agriculture. You know, yeah? So what uh, can we do about this? Well, uh, we may more use public uh, transport uh, uh, compared to the, our private cars. Yeah? Of course, we may save energy as much as possible in our uh, own homes, houses. We may reduce meat consumption, actually, yeah, because the, uh, the production of meat is also related to large emissions of, of CO2. Uh, we may utilize uh, garbage better than we do. We may use more second-hand uh, uh, products because the the less new product we consume, the less is uh, industry, the less is CO2 emissions. We may uh, save water as much as possible, yeah, because the uh, production of clean water is also related uh, uh, with uh, a lot of CO2 emissions. And finally, uh, we need um, better, how to say, information of, uh, of society and better education about this because people really, many people, well, at least in Russia, many people really do not know this and do not understand this process. And the one important point is that, uh, well, it's not enough just to reduce the CO2 emissions. We need to extract the CO2 from atmosphere if we want, uh, well, not to warm our planet uh, really too much. And uh, as promised, uh, I have a couple of slides about the links between the uh, environmental pollution and uh, uh, climate warming. Well, uh, uh, there are actually some links between, uh, between these issues, although the pollution is another topic which uh, I, I was not supposed to discuss uh, uh, initially. Well, many gases are at the same time pollutants and uh, uh, have greenhouse effects. For example, uh, like uh, N2O, ozone, uh, freons, uh, etc. Yeah, they are produced by human. They contaminate our atmosphere, uh, and they warm our uh, planet as well at the same time. Yeah, ozone is it's also a contamination uh, in the troposphere at least. Then aerosols, the dust. Yeah, we, produ uh, we produce a lot of dust, and uh, as uh, as I said, uh, it also has effect on uh, climate. And some uh, dust particles could be very very dangerous for our health. Yeah, for uh, also, well, uh, black carbon is a specific uh, uh, atmospheric aerosol, which also has a huge influence on climate because it may cover the glaciers, for example, and absorb, absorb just a lot of solar energy and destroy these glaciers, yeah? And at the same time, black carbon is uh, extremely dangerous for our health. Then CO2 is a poisonous gas by itself, by the way, yeah? If concentration of CO2 in your home exceeds uh, like 1000 ppm, it may be uh, dangerous for you. Then uh, uh, waste uh, storages, waste uh, landfills uh, is a quite uh, effective source of methane. And methane is a quite powerful uh, uh, greenhouse gas. And then uh, plastic, yeah, everybody will, uh, everybody are, is talking about the, the, the plastic, which is contaminating our planet, uh, which is true. And at the same time, plastic, uh, uh, it slowly degradates uh, uh, by sunlight with a releasing of uh, CO2. So it could be a source of greenhouse gas as well. 
uh, then some not very obvious uh, uh, links between uh, pollution and uh, climate change. For example, uh, because for, uh, for example, because of uh, uh, degradation of uh, sea ice in the Arctic, uh, the transportation uh, ways are changing. Yeah, a lot of uh, ships will go to the to the uh, Arctic. To the Arctic. Uh, well. On one hand, it, it is good because the transportation ways become shorter, so you consume less fuel for, for this. On the other hand, uh, the, for Arctic is not uh, very good because there will be more contamination uh, in the Arctic and more uh, influence on the ecosystems uh, in this region. Well, and finally, uh, in general, uh, the less uh, you consume, yeah, the less uh, 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 is uh, industrial production, the better for environment and the, because you produce less uh, garbage and the better for climate because you release uh, less CO2. So, so th there is uh, actually a very close, very tight fundamental uh, link uh, between these two uh, issues. Well, and this is the end of my presentation. This is the last uh, slide. Uh, and uh, well, please uh, listen to the scientists, you know, because scientists always uh, <laughs> uh, warn you about uh, some dangerous thing. And if you do not listen to them, well, it could be dangerous for you in the future. Uh, well, thank you very much. And now it's time for questions. Yes, we have a couple of questions from our colleagues. So first one is, uh, how much time do we have left before major ecological disasters happen? Uh, it's not easy to answer, you know, because uh, there is not just a single uh, answer, because each region is, uh, uh, for each region of our planet, there are different sets of, uh, how to say, uh, processes that happen, different uh, dangers, yeah? For example, for low-lying islands in Pacific, uh, well, the situation will be very dangerous by already 2050 or so, because the sea level is rising very fast. So these uh, small countries, they will have to, to move somewhere else. Yeah? And for example, for, I don't know, agri agriculture in, uh, Northwest region of Russia, where I live, it's uh, less in danger somehow because uh, now we have a not very favorable climatic situation. So in next decades, it may improve a little bit. Uh, yeah, but then it may uh, become worse uh, late in, in the century. So it's really, de it, it, it really de depends on uh, the region. But generally, we have something like a couple of decades or so, probably not. Not many times. Okay, thank you. And next question, uh, where can we see the data that you showed us? That uh, what, what sources do you recommend? Oh, that's a really wonderful question, thank you. Uh, you could see that I uh, often, quite often cite these uh, IPCC uh, reports. IPCC is a inter intergovernmental panel on climate uh, ch changes. It means that it, it, well, actually, it's a consortium of uh, scientists, yeah, we, uh, who uh, get, uh, get together to write these reports. They do not do this science themselves. It's a very important point. They just make a scientific review and assessment uh, of the scientific literature. And uh, in these uh, reports, the information is already digest digested in a simple way. So. Uh, so that uh, the uh, decision makers can understand it, you know. So I really recommend this, uh, this so, uh, source of information. It's up to date, it's reliable, and uh, it's uh, uh, simple to, to read more or less, and it's traceable, it's uh, very important, it's traceable. So if you read a statement like uh, this one, for example, yeah, which is shown in this picture, there, there is always links to the uh, to, to the literature, so you may trace it all the way down to the uh, original paper. And how to find it? I do not have the link here, but if you just uh, Google uh, this one, for example, you immediately 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 will 
see the uh, web page of IPCC and uh, yeah, it's easy to find. Okay, thank you. And another question, uh, how saving water reduces emissions? So except electricity needed to deliver and filter it. Well, but yeah, but it's already enough, you know. <laughs> uh, it's already enough. Uh, all these pumps uh, uh, which, need, which are needed to, you know, to supply the water from the source to you, because uh, in some cities, uh, the water is brought from many hundreds kilometers uh, away, yeah, clean water, like in Paris, uh, for example, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, so production of clean water, of clean water is, uh, it consumes quite a lot of energy, for sure. Okay, so there's one last uh, but very tricky question <laughs> and funny one. Uh, should we switch to work from home mode and stop traveling? <laughs> stop traveling. It's not recommended, you know, you should stay in isolation now until the uh, until this uh, epidemic uh, pandemic is, uh, is over. And how can you travel if uh, all the borders are closed now, for example? Well, uh, <laughs> I would uh, I would say that uh, as soon as you may stay home, please do it now. Not only because of this uh, climate situation, but because of uh, because of this pandemic. But when pandemic uh, is over, okay, me personally, I will uh, start to travel again because it's uh, part of my uh, uh, scientific activity as well. It's part of my how to say life and. Uh, what else can we do? We, we cannot stop everything. We cannot stop enjoying life <laughs> somehow. Yeah, but the question was good. Thank you. Okay. Th thank you very much, Alexei. That's, that's all from our side. Thank you for this interesting presentation. Oh, only three questions. It, it means that everything was clear, clear, or it means that it was not interesting at all. Probably. <laughs> no, it, it was interesting, really. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much.